that it was cleaving to the to the loved one, which is a very you know, interesting situation. And whether um, the the woman on the top of the roof was responding to some very deep grief, uh, you know, was she going through a psychotic episode, or was there really some sense that this, you know, unrequited lover had entered her her body, and no one is quite sure. Um, did you also talk about Samuel, uh, Saul and Samuel and the Witch of Endor? Yeah. You've talked about that already. Yeah, I brought that up because it's, it's, it's important to me, Jewish continuity of ideas, how these things go back and back and back um, and are part of our cultural, like, thoughts about the cosmology. Mm -hmm. um, that is a fascinating story from your family, Rabbi. Right. Uh, I hope that people were there for her through it. What? Oh, uh, eventually, they got her down from <laughs> from the roof. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah. To recap, what Talmud is in a couple lines for people who are unfamiliar. Talmud refers to the collections of early rabbinic thoughts and writings. It's made up of two parts: the Mishnah, which is the foundational attempt to organize and establish Jewish practice, uh, Jewish laws in everything from agriculture to how to run courts, to do holiday rituals. And that's wrapped up by about 220 CE um, in Israel, Palestine. And then the Gemara, which is commentary on the Mishnah from the rabbis until about 600 CE, writing in both er Israel, Palestine and Babylonia. Um, and it encompasses laws and legends and wisdom and it's timeless and it's cryptic. Um, and the text we're going to see from Talmud here today, copied from a phenomenal website, Safaria, which uses translations of Rabbi Adin Steinsalt's Zikrona Libracha. Uh, the bold text that you'll see is translating what's written in the Talmud, while the standard font is help to, helpful connected material, uh, but is sometimes later commentary read into the text. So always question translations you're given. Here I have a picture of um, the, the remains of the Cairo Geniza, sort of ghosts of, um, of long thrown away text. Mm -hmm. Just thinking about the different ways that ghosts live. Okay, so here's our first story. We call this Best Friends Forever. Yeah. Uh, we're in Brachot 618b, uh, A and B. The following story has been haunting my Safaria source sheet, a way to collect a bunch of sources together which is called Close Bechdel's in the Talmud. Um, I keep a list for any situations which are close to passing what's called the Bechdel test, which is a litmus test for feminism in media, which checks for preferably named women characters having conversations with each other about things other than men. It's very rare to find that in the Talmud, but it's really long and involves all parts of Jewish life. So eventually you find women. Um, and today we have ghost women. So uh, pay attention to the roles for women in this story and the messages that they might send. This volume of Talmud for context, Brachot, Blessings, is like most of the Talmud, no stranger to the supernatural. On page 6a, far in the beginning, there's discussion on how to see demons. And by the end of the tractate, 55a, 57b, we're given a guide to dream interpretation, which I would love to teach about. Here, the Gemara was discussing proper burial rituals and begins to veer into thoughts and philosophies about what the dead may think of the living. I have a reader for our green text here. I'll read. I'll read. Thank you. The Gemara relates that Rabbi Hia and Rabbi Yonatan were walking in a cemetery and the sky blue string of Rabbi Yonatan's ritual fringes was cast to the ground and dragging across the graves. Rabbi Hia said to him, lift it, so the dead will not say, tomorrow when their day comes, they will come to be buried with us, and now they are insulting us. Continue with this green text. Here. Rabbi Yonatan said to him, do, not, do the dead know so much? Isn't it stated? and the dead know nothing. 
Rabbi Chia said to him, if you read the verse, you did not read it a second time. And if you read it a second time, you did not read it a third time. And if you read it a third time, they did not explain it to you properly. The meaning of the verse is, for the living know that they will die and the dead know nothing and have no more reward for their memory has been forgotten. For the living know that they will die. These are the righteous who even in their death are called living. Thank you. And the Gemara offers some biblical proof about that claim, which you can explore later in this packet. Um, oh, that's right, here it is. Yeah. yeah, I include it because it sets the scene well. We have a, we're in a cemetery um, and we have this initial question. What's our question? What do the dead know? What do the dead know and what do they think of the living? <clears throat> I think we talk a lot, you hear a lot in our culture at least about such and such is looking down on you and smiling. Um, Hello. Very, which more in the Christian side of understandings, I think, but um, the looking down on you sort of so, angelified the dead loved ones. But here we have the idea that even an undying righteous person, like that righteous people, even after they die are like an undying kind of person who's said to still be alive. Um, and then further on, we see the opposite is true for the wicked who are called dead even when they are alive and a living ghost. So that's where we are. That's our initial question. I'll bring us down to our story. Um, a little later on, Rabbi Chaya's children, after he has died himself, call out to him and um, wonder if he knows their pain um, of, of losing their father. Okay, so here, here's our story for this morning. Um, the story appears to be brought as a proof to the dead's knowledge of the living, but I'm hoping that we can find many more morals and messages this morning. Can I have a reader for this part that starts in the green here? And the Gemara challenges this. I don't mind doing it. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the Gemara, is my volume okay for everyone? Mm -hmm. Okay. The Gemara challenges this. And it is so that the dead who do not know the pain of others, wasn't it taught that in Barita there was an incident involving a pious man who gave a poor man a dinar on the eve of Rosh Hashanah during drought years, and his wife mocked him for giving so large a sum at such a difficult time, at so difficult a time, and in order to escape her incessant mockery, he went in and slept in the cemetery. That night in his dream, he heard two spirits conversing with each other. One said to the other, my friend, let us roam the world and hear from behind the heavenly curtain, which separates the divine presence from the world. What calamity will befall the world? The other spirit said to her, I cannot go with you as I am buried in a mat of reeds, but you go and tell me what you hear. She went and roamed and came back. The other spirit said, my friend, what did you hear from behind the heavenly curtain? She replied, I heard that anyone who sows during the first rainy season of the year, hail will fall and strike his crops. Hearing this, the pious man went and sowed his seed during the second rainy season. Ultimately, the crops of the entire world were stricken by hail and his crops were not stricken. Thank you for reading. No problem. So what's happened so far? Pious man gives some charity. His wife doesn't like how much charity he's given. They fight. He goes and sleeps in the cemetery of all places. Um, and note that this line, that night in his dream, um, Steinsaltz brings three different, per three different commentators who have inserted over the years that it's a dream. Um, and we can wonder why these commentators need to imagine that it's a dream instead of imagining that he slept in this, he like went to the cemetery and actually heard ghosts um, because the Talmud text does not call it a dream. So just to muddy it. Um, and what do they hear? It's two spirits, um, Ruchot um, and their friends. And the one says to the other, um, let's go listen to the Pargod, um, which anybody who's uh, was around for my demonology study know the angels and demons also listen to the Pargod. Um, she says, I can't go because I'm buried under a mat of reeds. So our friendly spirits are called ruchot, um, which is a plural of ruach, like spirit, right? Um, which is also wind and air and direction and mind, disposition, 
spirit and soul. Um, and the word is often used to refer to demons or a class of demons such as the Ruach Ra that comes over King Saul. I believe that our characters are not demons even though they're called Ruchot because they're buried. Nevertheless, it's a fascinating connection between souls and wind. And for more on the Pargode, I recommend um, Matthew Kressel has a blog of 36 days of Judaic myth and one on the Pargode, which is the divine curtain. He explains that it reflects the curtains of the Torah Ark and the Holy of Holies, saving even supernatural beings from the effects of seeing the Holy One directly. The Pargode is also a mystical tapestry that's infinite and recounts all history and future and represents the divine's endless knowledge. In other words, A plus field trip material. And here's an illustration by Dove Letterberg, a 3D Kabbalah illusionist artist uh, of his imagining of the Pargode. I imagine this in flux, like a, like a flowing liquid. Okay. Questions so far, um, we're gonna read the next section, but I wanna pause and invite thoughts. So, so this Pargode picture, is almost exactly a picture I got out of a mathematical equation 15 years ago. It's scary and weird. Uh, I can send it to you, but it, it's crazy how 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 emergent this um, image is. Oh, I love that, Greg. And and this equation it has a lot of meaning to me. So I'm just going to be silent for a little while and look at it. <laughs> a reader for the next paragraph. Uh, just a, a, a couple of thoughts. Um, there is. Uh, the idea that there are klipot out there that are seeking to do mischief of one kind or another. And one of the reasons that uh, the, the uh, spouses break the glass at the end of a wedding is to try to keep the klipot away from, from spoiling the relationship, ruining the marriage, um, in addition to the whole notion of the, um, you know, of the, loss of the temple. So um, again, that's very interesting that that sort of weaves in uh, into our uh, Talmudic tradition and into our ritual tradition. Uh, also, you know, when someone says something positive about your child or about you or a friend, you know, that whole idea, no evil eye, poo, poo, poo. Mm -hmm. uh, that somehow that's going to, um, you know, somehow uh, that's going to, to curse the, re the relationship, you know, rather than bless it. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if these hands are still raised from earlier um, or if they're newly raised, um, Arden and also my dad. I was uh, just volunteering to read them. Oh, thank you, Arden. Go for it. The following year, on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, the same pious man went and slept in the cemetery at his own initiative. And again, he heard two spirits conversing with each other. One said to the other, let us roam the world and hear from behind the heavenly curtain what calamity will befall the world. She said to her, my friend, have I not already told you that I cannot, as I am buried in a mat of reeds? Rather, you go and tell me what you hear. She went and roamed and returned. The other spirit said to her, My friend, what did you hear from behind the curtain? She said to her, I heard that those who sow during the rainy season, blight will strike his crops. That pious man went and sowed during the first rainy season. Since everyone else sowed during the second rainy season, ultimately the crops of the entire world were blighted and his crops were not blighted. Thank you. 
Okay. What is with the mat of reeds preventing a ghost from journeying to the heavenly realms, you ask? To answer this, a good friend of mine and fellow queer Talmud camp Savarnik, Rabbi Brian Mann and I, uh, we turn to the Ben Yehoyada commentary, which is by Yosef Chaim. He's 1800s Sephardic in Baghdad. Um, and he wrote a rather extensive commentary on the Agadah of the Talmud, the legends of the war. And so we translated it um, so we could learn what was going on. So I have our translation sort of paraphrased below. But I also want to show off this hollow that I baked yesterday of our scene um, going on. So here's our one ghost girl. This is our, our sort of Karen of rocks. And she's trying to get her other friend up, but her other friend is in a mat of reeds. And they're on top of, um, as a modeling background, the Encyclopedia of Jewish Myth, Magic, and Mysticism um, open up to the section on ghosts. Because it's rather hard to find artwork sometimes. I commissioned a piece later on in our packet. If we get there, we'll see it. But I don't have much for drawing, but I thought I could model them with Hala. So here they are. OK. And here's the moon. So uh, the Ben Yohayada commentary is going to tell us what's up with the mat of reeds. According to Hagaon Hatzlecha, um, Zechonah Libracha, so he's quoting somebody else to start with. The soul is not able to separate from the body until the flesh has been consumed to completion. Therefore, we have the mitzvah to bury in the ground in order that the flesh is consumed quicker and therefore wrap the dead in linen so that the flesh becomes worm eaten and does not delay the rotting of the body. Um, one is buried in a mat of reeds is in the ama anya the arms of the poor, mm -hmm. because there was not sufficiency in their hands. There was not the, the financial security to dress her in a wrapping of linen. And he likes this. Um, he likes this so far as it, as it is. The explanation of the Rav comes correctly to the plain meaning of the text, but it's distressing that it was not heard in a different way, that it was not heard like this, that if one dies poor, surely the community will make a shroud for them so they don't have to have their body, uh, so their body can decay quickly. And that this would be a known matter because the whole community would come together to help. But her situation was not known. Therefore, it appears to me that she was indeed buried in a shroud by custom because otherwise everyone would have known because they would have had to all come together to make the shroud. So she must have been buried in a shroud. But it is known that there are wicked ones called Amgoshi, who are Persian priests, maguses, sorcerers, and that it was their way to dig up graves in the night in secret and separate the shroud from the dead as needed for deeds of witchcraft. And so perhaps this is what happened. The Amgoshi took the shroud from her and by providence beside her grave was a mat of reeds that was thrown there and they enwrapped her in it and returned her to the grave where her body could not decay and where she could not roam the spirit world and listen to the pargod with her friend. It's a fascinating optimism for Jewish altruism that the community would always come together in this way. Um, and an equally fascinating backstory. Um, there's lots to be said about class and access to various kinds of burial that still continues today. Um, families go bankrupt over trying to help um, give a respectful send off to their loved ones. Um, Moed Katan 27 A and B discusses the origins of Jewish custom to bury all deceased in plain linen in a simple wooden casket, trying to encourage some equality between rich and poor and death. And just as one other note on this, another source says that interment in a simple reed mat was considered a token of disrespect to the dead, um, suggested in the eyes of the people that the departed had been placed under a ban and could not be united with the bands of spirits pervading the world. That source doesn't cite any other sources, so I don't know where it got it, but just to throw that in there. Just gonna let that all breathe for a second and invite any thoughts about this mat of reeds or about um, 
what allows a ghost to do ghost things. Hey, hey Olivia, yeah. it's Bill. Yeah. Um, what would be the uh, Jewish perspective on the Egyptian practice of embalming, given that the body never deteriorates? Do they believe that the soul is always trapped within the body and never separates after death? I would think following um, following the Ben Yehoyada's uh, quoting of the Haga'on Hatzlacha, um, that yes, I would think they would say that you know if the body never decomposes, the the spirit can never free up. Um, but I would I would uh, refrain from saying that that's like the Jewish perspective on the like answering the question. The only yeah. time in the Torah that it happens is for Joseph because he was a high-ranking Egyptian official. So when he died, um, he was embalmed in part, it says also, so that his body could be transported however many years later it needed to be to come home. It's the only instance I know of and great pains are taken to give reasons why so that clearly isn't accepted. Happens a lot in modern times, but. Uh... Yeah, Rabbi Bism. Given like this specific description that it's important so that the flesh is consumed quickly and everything, wouldn't that almost encourage a cremation type ritual as well? Or like in this specific instance, it, it almost seems because that would be. Is it yeah. Like, I, I know usually in Judaism, it's not. I'm just saying according to, like, this specific passage, mm -hmm. if the concern is that the flesh is consumed quickly and returned to the earth, but is there a reason that the cremation is still looked down? The body to the earth. Yeah, Ellie Sheva said that um, cremation does not return the body to the earth, which I think is the, the idea, mm -hmm. like, humans created from dirt return to dirt. Mm -hmm. So, and basically, so, we become compost. <laughs> yeah. So, so many Jewish traditions are made to separate us from pagan customs, and um, my my impression here is that being buried in a mat of reeds was actually um, traditional for some cultures, um, like the Kaputi did this always, and so possibly this is just to separate us. So we don't do that, they do. And if you do it, then, you know, you'll be a ghost and like that. Gotcha, <laughs> that, that makes a lot of sense. Also, when um, there, there, there is a belief at some level in decomposition, because remember that when um, the Israelites cross the Sea of Reeds, they bring the bones of Joseph to yep. be buried in Canaan. So um, there's a there's a there's an ambiguity there, and there is a reality for so many people um, that the whole process from the you know of the funeral parlor, you know, a classic burial costs somewhere between five and ten thousand dollars, and some people are saying, "No, I'm sorry, cremate me." Um, and that, you know, creates another tension here um, because of, um, you know, because of a reality of, um, you know, the, the Jewish experience of burial. Thank you. So where does our story go next? I get a reader for our third um, our third section of our story. I can't hold my glasses. So the pious man's wife said to him, why is it that last year, the crops of the entire world were stricken and yours were not stricken. And now this year, the crops of the entire world were blighted and yours were not blighted. He related to her the entire story. They said, it was not even a few days later that a quarrel fell between the pious man's wife and the mother of the young woman who was buried there. The pious man's wife said to her scornfully, go and I will show you your daughter and you will see that she is buried in a mat of reeds. 
So I may be looking in the wrong places, but I haven't found much imagining about how this kata, kata ta, um, which is the word for a quarrel, which I think is a fabulous word for a quarrel, katata, um, between Mrs. Pious Man and Mrs. Ghost Girl's mom. Um, but I have our definition of this word, so maybe we can imagine what, what this is. Um, so Jastro, this big honking Tama dictionary right here, um, offers quarrel, dispute, or discord from um, tat tat, cut, or diminish, or make fine, or even the woof, which is the weaving or the weft, uh, by beating it down, to vex, annoy, or thin, uh, and then from thinning, to produce a high sound, or sing tenor or soprano. I will say my instinct is that they were not sharing a duet uh, about the memory of it her daughter. It comes to Hebrew from the original Klingon. <laughs> it's also um, a marvelous leonomata poetic word. I mean, it sounds like bickering. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Katata, katata. <laughs> um, uh, maybe something's missing. Um, maybe the implications of reed map burials have been lost, or maybe it is what this one had said that it was um, uh, disrespectful. And so saying like your daughter is buried in a mat of reeds is a disrespectful thing to say or implication. Um, my, maybe she's concerned that her husband is hanging out with this other woman's ghost daughter. Sure, honey, that sounds very likely uh, in the cemetery. He thinks there's something else going on. Um, you can even consider the Ben Yohoyada from above um, and imagine that the reaction a mother may have to being told that her daughter's grave has been ransacked by magicians. Um, my best hope is that the wife was trying to convince the mother that she should rebury her daughter so that she could properly have ghost adventures with her friend. Um, in any case, the word scornfully, while a reasonable guess based on the word katata, uh, is actually not in the Talmud text. Um, and it's often disappointing to see commentary make relations um, between the few women who are present in the Talmud bickersome. Um, okay. um, and here's the end of our story. Um, can we have one more reader for the end of our story? Or thoughts about um, about this section with the with between the, the wife and the mother. Oh, uh, I could read it. Thank you. Yeah, go for it. Uh, From we, here. We, oh, the following year? Mm -hmm. The following year, he again went and slept in the cemetery and heard the same spirits conversing with each other. One said to the other, my friend, let us roam the world and hear from behind the heavenly, heavenly, heavenly curtain what calamity will befall the world. She said to her, my friend, leave me alone as words that we have privately exchanged between us have already been heard among the living. Apparently the dead know what transpires in this world. And the next paragraph. The Gemara responds, this is no proof, perhaps another person who heard about the conversation of, this, of the spirits secondhand died and he went and told them that they had been overheard because the Talmud always needs a second opinion. <laughs> Thank you, Celine. Sure. Remember that our story was introduced as an answer to the question, what do the dead know of the living? And so they've told this whole story that leads up to the conclusion that the friends know that there's been this whole, that there, that there are prophecies that she's heard at the heavenly curtain and reported back to her friend who couldn't go out uh, that's been there. So that's their, that's the way they're using it, but I think they're probably using it in other ways. And we can use this story in a lot of other ways too. Um, wondering who people relate to in this story. I certainly feel like I've been both ghosts, uh, sometimes full of energy, trying to drag friends out on an adventure and sometimes buried under a mat of exhaustion and work and anxiety. 
I always appreciate the invite, uh, even if I can't get out from underneath it all. What metaphors or cultural standards are we drawing from this narrative? Mayor? Uh, um, one, one, of my, one of my thoughts initially was that this, um, why, um, there's only one witness to hearing these, these things across the veil or whatever. And Judaism usually depends on two witnesses to corroborate a story. So the rabbis would cook up this instance in which uh, you really can't get at the truth because one person is not, is not there. The, other, the second person is not there. So you're relying on one person's story to tell you the truth. And it's kind of very questionable. So you would only put more credence in if the second ghost went and reported the same thing as the first ghost. I like that. Yeah, witnesses. Yeah, witnesses. Yeah. Yeah. So and this, is, this has been a wonderful presentation. I'm really grateful. I, th I think that I want to point out a couple of things. The irony in the rabbis writing this story, describing what they imagine is happening in the heavenly realm, and impute, then discussing what, the, what the, the, the dead know while the living describe the dead, right? It creates this, this sort of tautological circle, right? There, in this story, this, this capstone piece of the story, the, the, the human beings who are describing that which is taking place in heaven and surmising why it is or what it is that the dead know are taking upon themselves knowledge of, of the world beyond, right, of, of Olam Haba. And I want to pick up on um, what Brendan's com comment was, or question was, whether they take this seriously or treat it as folklore. I think the answer, not to be cute or, or, or predictable, but is yes, in the same way um, as issues of, um, in particular, funerary practices, which are perfect ways to distinguish yourself and your group from the next group over. So if you've gone to, um, uh, in a black church, a funeral for a young person, we talk about how the, or any, of any age, we talk about how they're in a better place, which is not a metaphor we use in Judaism. But it comes right up, about, up it abuts funerary practices do with theology, which is why it's very easy to make that leap, which is why, Cremation may be a bridge too far for some because it's not only earth, the, the dust not returning to the earth, but it's not even going into the earth. It's, it's going up to the heavens, right? So all these, all these ideas. And we, we traffic in these, what I call folk theology all the time. When the bar mitzvah boy or bar mitzvah girl says, I know grandma and grandpa are looking down on me, we don't disabuse them. Or when the second uh, 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 in a couple is buried and the children say, well, now they're together again. Or... We have all kinds of folk theologies that we work with. And you've likely, each of us on this call, have had things that we might otherwise dismiss as a coincidence, but somehow seem too meaningful for that. And so we ascribe meaning to events or patterns or other things that we see that we read into them. Um, and so this isn't some antediluvian notion that there's a world that we move within or among but can't actually access, except on a rare occasion. Um, and so I just want to say that, that we're, we're playing with these same ideas today. We just dress them up in different ways. There's also the whole tradition, you know, particularly you see in the Midrashic literature, of transmigration of souls. And the whole idea that you know, someone, else, someone is the Gilgul of someone who lived in the past. Uh, and you see, uh, in, particularly in um, the Sifre to Bamidbar and Devarim, you see lots of discussion about this person living in Roman times is the Gilgul of someone else, you know, and this person is the Gilgul of someone else, or this one was the, is the Gilgul of some notable rabbi. Um, and it still, it still runs through that whole Midrashic tradition very strongly. Thank you. There's a whole book of Jewish stories of reincarnation I learned about from a guest we had at Road F Shalom, Rabbi uh, Andrew Kirtan Han, mm -hmm. which was a fascinating insight into right. just the multitude of ways that we conceptualize afterlife in Judaism. Right. I wanna bring um, uh, at least one more before we wrap up today. This story goes on 
um, continues a little bit more because they still want to sort out exactly what the dead know of the living, despite being the living trying to tell what the dead know when they're not. Yes, it's quite an irony. Um, in this one, a rabbi deposits his money with an innkeeper who dies and he goes to her grave um, and she tells him where it is and asks for her to send her comb and tube of eyeshadow with a woman who will die tomorrow. And a comic to go with it. Okay. Um, so if any story this morning can be said to be well known, uh, it's this one. It's a pair of reflections on the pain of death and the fear of dying. This section of Moed Katan discusses many poetic eulogies and fascinating mystical deaths of various rabbis. As we read the passages, remember of course that the standard font um, is additional. So when they say that these ghosts appear in a dream, that's added. It might, it might be true, but it's added. Um, Okay, and there's lots more on the angel of death in the Talmud, uh, but it's actually not written in this text. So we'll go back and forth there too. Yeah, um, we still, we have a hand up. Um, okay, um, so can I get a reader for our first, um, actually, you know what? I'm gonna hop right to here, um, yes. And I commissioned this piece uh, from a friend, June, um, who I think is with us this morning. Um, yeah, of this story. So we'll see what's being depicted. Um, can we get a reader for the top of the page? Um, I can read it. Thank you. It was similarly related that Rava sat before Rav Nachman and he saw that Rav Nachman was dozing, that he's slipping into death. Rav Nachman said to Rav, Mas to Rav Master, tell the angel of death not to torment me. Rav said to him, Master, uh, uh, are you not an important person who is re in respected in heaven? Rav Nachman said to him, in the super, uh, super now? Supernatural. Yeah, supernatural, the, the above, oh, beyond. Supernatural world, who is important, who is honorable, who is complete. And then for this next paragraph too. Rava said to Rav Nach Nachman, Master appeared to me in a dream after your death. And he appeared to him. Rava said to him, Master, did you have pain in death? Rav Nachman said to him, like the removal of hair from milk which is a most gentle process. But nevertheless, were the Holy One blessed be he to say to me, go back to that world, the physical world, as you were, I would not want to go, for the fear of the angel of death is great. And I would not want to go through such a terrifying experience a second time. Thank you. Um, here June has uh, drawn the angel lifting hair from milk in a sort of um, well, come to life yeah. uh, with these like clawed hands. Uh, yeah, Salini. No, I mean, that sounds like a gentle death. I mean, that would be something that I think most people would want rather than something horrible, you know, suffering to be that gentle in dying. I mean, that would be a, a real blessing. What I'm hearing from what he says is the process of death wasn't painful, but how he felt about it, his fears about it, were what were painful. 100%. Yes. In the previous story, they set up the same situation, but they say it's like the prick of the knife when, um, when letting blood. And another depiction here from Snapshots from the Garden of Eden by Dina Goldstein. Um, and how she set it up. Um, June, if you want to talk at all about your process of making this art, I, we have the artist in the room. Sometimes it's very hard to find depictions of Talmud stories. Um, and especially the stuff I want to teach. So that's why I baked a challah for art here and have reached out to a friend to um, contribute. Yeah, good morning, everyone. 
Um, I guess this was just more of a literal interpretation of the text. Um, yeah, so we have the rabbi in bed, and then um, Rabba is in the doorway, kind of looking on um, as a witness um, in the dream of what's happening. And then, yes, the angel of death coming in through the window. Um, yeah, I had a lot of fun with this piece, and I appreciate you commissioning me and including this in your lecture. Um, and sorry again for not making the angel of death a little bit more frightening, <laughs> but she okay. does have the claws, so. Yeah, definitely. Um, if anybody was around for my angel of death class last year, the, the Talmud at least at one point says the angel of death is entirely covered with eyes. Um, Ooh, that would be a dreadful thing. <laughs> yuck. Um, and yet, you know, they're, they're sort of on good terms. So, um, yeah, I just, I love the motion of it all. I love that, like, the, it's warm. It feels warm. It feels like, like warm milk like, leaving that moment. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, one other thing, um, those of us who studied liturgy in the New York School with Larry Hoffman, um, remember that at a um, at a at a uh, baby naming ceremony, um, sometimes it it um, occurred after a brit milah that you have the phrase, may this person get to know Torah, Kupa, Umasim Tovim. And the interpretation was, by saying, saying this, it keeps the klipot and the demons away. Uh, interesting that something that we see in a very you know, plain sense has yet a deeper meaning within our mystical tradition and clearly a, a feeling about an understanding of uh, klipot, of, of demons. Thank you. Sure. Um, uh, Dad, do you have your hand up? I see your hand is raised, but I'm not sure if I left it up from earlier again. That was from a while ago. I was just saying all this material, to answer my own question from before, seems to suggest that the rabbis did take these ghosts or spirits plainly seriously. There's nothing in this material to indicate that they're questioning for a moment whether or not they exist. So maybe there's a disconnect between these times and modern times. I think certainly, I think it's, I think it's sort of hinted at in the fact that um, the commentary has to read into it the idea that it's in a dream that the later commentary is uncomfortable with the idea that it's just, that they're just seeing um, a ghost. Even Maimonides tries to chalk all of the angel in, um, encounters in the Bible up to dreams. So is saying that it's in a dream a way of discounting its reality? That's how I'm taking it. I, I'm not, I can't say for certain, but that's, that's what my instinct is. Um, or they're trying to say, well, it did happen, but it was in a dream. I mean, maybe they hold dreams to be even more mystical than like having seen it I think um, in person, because we can learn all about the dream interpretation at the end of Brachot. Whether um, the dream saying it's a dream is throwing shade on it. No, yeah. No. I, think um, it gives, I think it gives I, them plausible deniability. I think it allows them. It, it, it's the way um, when men, when Tevia tells Goldie that he had a dream last night where her her mother, her grandmother came to her. It makes it plausible that without being crazy, you know. Yeah. Plenty of dreams in the Torah, though, that are Correct. supposed to be taken quite literally. Correct. But but I think it's also our certainly our modern thinking. Um, I hold these things terribly literally, but all of the prohibitions in the Torah against necromancy and talking to spirits and all those things, you don't have to make rules against things unless they're happening and unless they're happening quite commonly. And I think it is very natural of human beings to try to figure out this 
mystery that we all confront all our lives, um, whether we know somebody who has died or whether we just think ahead to our own ceasing to exist. This is a natural thing that humans do and we wouldn't make rules against it unless it happened. So I'm sure that it happened at all periods. And in the Talmud, they, they use the material to, to teach a lesson, to, to glean something out of it, since it's a fact of life. One more, and then we'll wrap up with some discussion. Um, I've been, one, uh, but don't touch. Oh, Arden, yeah, I saw your, I saw your oh, hand. Sorry. Right now. Um, I've been curious in the, the last story that we read. Um, I don't have an answer for this. I just wanted to pose some questions or troubles to the group. Um, one is that why are the ghosts so interested in generating what seems to be like an almanac of the world? You know, like they're, they seem to be quite concerned with the growing seasons in, in a world that they are no longer a part of. And that just seems very strange to me. You know, as always, the Talmud is kind of obsessed with minutia and with the sort of very daily practical things. But um, that always seems strange. And the second is that uh, a lot of those stories seem to be precipitated by a marital fight that there was this sort of tension in between this like, you know, man and his wife. And then he kind of, you know, so bad that he's, you know, sleeping not just on the couch, but in the cemetery, uh, or in some cases seems to be sort of running away from having a conversation with her. There seems to be a bit of a spirit of, um, no pun intended, a little bit of like a thread of misogyny maybe running through both of those stories and that like, you know, he's not able to deal with the situation and she's so, you know, shrieking that he has to be driven to the graveyard. And then these women are so gossiping. Um, and I'm just, uh, noticing that and troubled by it and curious by it and would love uh, other people's thoughts and reactions. I too am frustrated when the only women present are fighting about something. Um, even though it's a two out of three Bechdel because they don't have names and they are talking to each other and it's not about a man, they are fighting, which is a disappointing situation. Um, we can talk more about that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I love that. I love that, like the gossip that, that she wants, though. I kind of like that she's like, I want to know the terrible thing that's going to happen to the world this year. That's like, I get to know that now I'm dead. I get to like see ahead. Like, if you died in 2019 and had 2020 spoilers, like, would you, like, <laughs> I mean, would you t go and take them? Or would you, as a ghost, want to just be surprised like everyone else? I, I, I think it's interesting also that this happens every year on the eve of Rosh Hashanah exactly. uh, when ostensibly the book of life is being is open and being written and like I just I wonder about the timing of all of it if this happens every every night actually and maybe we just this man just only fights with his wife on the eve of Rosh Hashanah every year and sleeps in the sun. <laughs> or or if there's something about the timing of the new year and yeah spoilers uh and like maybe this is a time when the deceased can also kind of know something about what's gonna happen uh because they're closer to god maybe i don't know i don't know it's kind of interesting We've got access to God's notes. Okay, I have one more story I want to point everyone to. Um, this one is a story of burial caves. Um, we're not. We're going to read the very end of it, but um, <laughs> we're just going to get the coda. But just to summarize, the first part tells of a rabbi Benaa whose job or perhaps pet project is to mark burial caves, um, especially the, knowing that those of priestly lineage are to avoid the ritual impurity of the dead and avoid cemeteries in general. Um, so he finds the cave of Abraham and Sarah, which we'll learn about in a few weeks. And Eliezer, uh, the biblical Abraham's eternal servant, waits outside to tell the rabbi that they're having a gently affectionate time, that she's like, cradling his head in there um, and doesn't allow him in. It's not quite clear if they never died or if they're ghosts or what's going on. And I invite you to read it later and tell me what you think. Um, but he finds the grave of Adam next and the bot Cole, a divine voice 
um, tells him to turn back, that humanity was designed so closely to God that to look on the spirit of Adam in this grave would be like looking at the Holy One. And then the rabbis have a quick like beauty contest between the different uh, matriarchs. Um, and after all that, we get to um, the tomb of Rabbi Tovi, which we're gonna hop to. Um, and I just made a note about how, when I went to Queer Talmud camp for the first time, I met somebody, Sarah Palmer of the Lace Midrash, who was working on a series of paintings featuring rabbis' adventures with caves. And I expressed my surprise that there could be enough stories to make such a collection. And two and a half years later, this isn't even my favorite story about rabbis and caves. So just to let you know that this is a common location. Okay, so here's our last story for this morning. Um, anyone who's wanting to read and hasn't read yet this last one uh, here. This is, our, this is our scary ghost story. I'll read. Thank you. On the topic of burial caves, the Gemara oh. relates that there was a certain ma magus. Mm -hmm. We learned um, about the maguses earlier um, in the commentary from Ben Yehoyada, who said that they had dug up the ghost girl and reburied her to, in a mat of reeds. Uh, right. There was a certain magus who was rummaging through the graves of the dead. When he arrived at the burial cave of Rav Tovi Bar Matana, Rav Tovi grabbed him by his beard and would not release him. <laughs> Abaye came and said to Rav Tovi, I beg of you to release him. The magus came again in another year and Rav Tovi grabbed him by his beard. Abaye came and requested that he release him, but Rav Tovi did not release him until Abaye brought a scissors and cut his beard. <laughs> That's our, that's our spooky story um, for this morning. Uh, the rabbis, Indiana Jones and the rabbis revenant, as we might um, see it. <laughs> um, Abaye, just so you know, has a lot of experience with demons. So finding him in this zombie, ghost, skeleton, booby trap tale is a fine addition to his narrative. Um, and the Magus, uh, as we saw earlier, the Amgosha, Amgoshi, um, is this Persian priest or dream interpreter. And the Book of Legends, this um, text, gives a lot, gives some good insight. Um, they clarify that Persian fire worshipers um, considered it sinful to defile the earth by the burial of dead bodies in it. And so they would exhume the bodies to expose them to the birds. And they also guess that Abaye is friends with the Magus. Um, so maybe we can think of some reasons why Abaye might intercede um, in this like specter. Um, it's like a rate, it's like a religious tension I see going on between different practices and the kind of hostility that can cause. Um, and perhaps his scissors cut a truce. Um. But what kind of interesting to me is the interactions back and forth between living and dead. Um, I mean, that's an awful lot of interactions, which is not what we usually think in terms of Judaism. Yeah, I had to make cuts. <laughs> or rather, I had other stories that I could have brought too. Um, I think uh, it was Arden at the beginning who asked about where did these go? Like why, why if these feel ubiquitous or just that we could have a whole class of them, have these stories not been taught to us? Um, or why do they seem almost ridiculous that Judaism would have ghosts? Um. This is where, this is the cave where Abaye is buried. To note that. We should say that, that in the 20th century, at least, and after magic goes back further, um, there was a real um, fear of teaching mysticism as a kind of, it wasn't on rabbinical school curricula, that kind of thing. It's a whole genre and area of Jewish study, but it was omitted deliberately, much like I suspect these stories were put, cut, cut out of the canon or pushed aside or considered pre-modern, less you go too deep into these and 
you'd be led astray. I mean, there's a healthy respect for the fact that these are not verifiable stories. You can't reproduce them based on the scientific method and conjure a spirit whenever you need one. Um, there's a real risk in, in allowing this kind of thought, argue the elites, right, to, to be available to anyone. Uh, Rabbi Bisno, um, do you think we become poorer for it? Sure, sure. Yeah. Right? Yes. It's a, it, 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 it's a, um, it would be, it, it would be, a, it's a category mistake to, uh, to decide that, that we're not going to be aware of these, these things, right? That, that we're not going to confront emotion because we're too rational or we're not going to confront um, the fact that life itself is a mystery and what happens after death is a mystery and we struggle with these ideas or suspend disbelief, but to, to act as if we can't discuss them or that these questions that you and I have today aren't existential questions that go as far back um, mm -hmm. yes, it leaves us the poorer for not having that wider appreciation, I believe. Yes. So you've done us a good service, Olivia, bringing us to us on Halloween morning. <laughs> this is your tradition. This is in your tradition. These are, these are the ghost stories that our ancestors left for us. Um, you are welcome to consider them. You are welcome to incorporate them into your conception of Jewish afterlife. You're welcome to completely disregard them as also as a tradition of your ancestors. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope that, um, I hope that they impact you in some way. Jewish lore, uh, in Jewish lore, the same supernatural concept can come in many forms and serve many purposes. Our ghosts this morning, they damaged those defiling their graves, they answered questions about life and death, at death only they could. They helped the living, they minded their own business, they followed their dreams, um, and they found themselves bound to the earth in frustrating ways. Um, what have we learned from these legends of ghosts told by ancestors long dead themselves? Take some time to consider your afterlife philosophy. Well, Halloween is a good time for it, especially as the world around us retreats into a dormant state. Um, if your mind ends up in highly Christianized places or no place at all, perhaps these could invite uh, these conceptions into your cosmic understanding. See how they bring comfort and concern into your moral life. Shabbat Shalom and a happy Halloween, everyone. Thank Shabbat you. Shalom, Olivia. Olivia. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I came late, I had to go out and I, I started a little bit late. Are you at all possible, able to send me the, the reading materials from the very beginning? I missed about 15 minutes of the... Of yeah. The, okay. Um, if you look, if you scroll in the chat, do you have access to the chat? I'm sorry, what is that? <laughs> yeah. are, you, are you on a, a PC? I am on my cell phone. Oh, you're on your cell phone? Um, well, I will send it to you. Um, I, put, I got it up on YouTube a little late because it was having trouble getting up on Facebook. Okay. Um, so about the start of the first story, the, the, the opening part, um, we'll get you the, I'll get you the packet. For anybody who does have access to the chat, um, if you scroll up a little bit, I put the packet uh, as a Google Drive link. It's a PDF that you can have and study and... Um, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Olivia, it was wonderful. Thank you all so much. Um, we have our service at 1030, so I'm going to depart.